Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's event. My name is Samira Qawar and I'm a trustee of the Banipal Trust for Arab Literature. Today, we're presenting the sixth annual Saif Ghubash Banipal Translation Prize Lecture hosted by the British Library. The award-winning literary translator Jonathan Wright will speak on change and continuity in contemporary Arabic fiction. A brief word about the Banipal Trust. It was established in September 2004 by Banipal Magazine's publisher to support and celebrate publishing Arab authors in English translation, to deepen and enrich cultural dialogue between the Arab world and the West by working to bring the works of contemporary Arab authors to English speakers worldwide. The Trust supports and promotes the translation of literary works by contemporary Arab authors into English and the publication of the Banipal magazine of modern Arab literature and English translation three times a year. Our annual translation prize, the Saif Robash Banipal Prize for Arabic Literary Translation was first awarded in 2006 and is made possible by a generous grant from Omar Saif Robash and his family in memory of his late father, Saif Robash. The annual lecture, also supported by Omar Saif Robash and his family, was set up to celebrate the 10th yearly award of the prize and can focus on any aspect of Arabic literature and translation. Our lecturer, Jonathan Wright, studied Arabic at Oxford and worked as a journalist for Reuters for many years, mostly in the Arab world. He turned to literary translation in 2008 and has since translated more than 20 novels and other books, as well as dozens of short stories. His most recent translations are the book of Collateral Damage by Sinan Anton and God 99 by Hassan Blasim. He won the 24 Independent Foreign Fiction Prize for his translation of Hassan Blasim's The Iraqi Christ and the 2016 Saif Robash Banipal Prize for his translation of Saud al Sanusi's The Bamboo Stalk. In 2015, he was commended for his translation of Amjad Nasser's Land of No Rain and he was joint winner of the 2013 prize for Yusuf Zidane's Azazil. His translation of Ahmad Sadawi's Frankenstein in Baghdad was shortlisted for the 2018 Man Booker International Prize and his translation of Mazen Maruf's Jokes for the Gunman, Gunmen was longlisted for the 2019 prize. His translations were also shortlisted for the 2018, 19, and 2020 Saif Robash Banipal Prize. His translations also include works by Hamur Ziada, Ibrahim Isa, Khalid Al Khamisi, Rasha Al Amir, Fahd Al Atiq, Ala Al Aswani, Izzuddin Fishir, Galal Amin, and Baha Abdul Majid. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the event, you can submit them throughout using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. I'll put selected questions to Jonathan after his lecture. At the end of the event, a survey will pop up. We'd be very grateful if you took some time to fill it out. This will help our partners, the British Library, to continue to plan their cultural events program. Now, without further ado, I invite our special guest, Jonathan Wright, to take the floor. Good evening and welcome, Ahlan Masahlan. Thank you for logging in. Thank you to the Banipal Trust for giving me this platform, a larger platform than I usually have. And thank you to the British Library for hosting. It's a pity we can't be physically present but doing it this way does allow people to take part from all over the world. It's conventional at these events to start by saying how honored and privileged you are to be speaking. In my case, it's more like surprised and perplexed, always prone to imposter syndrome. I feel it triply in this case. I'm not a specialist in Arabic literature, let alone in Arabic literature, in all its historical vastness. I'm not an academic, 
in a niche occupation where academics long dominated the field. I've never studied translation theory, though when I hear theoretical discussions, they do make sense to someone who makes language choices every day. Even when I speak Arabic, it comes out as a mishmash of modern standard Arabic and Egyptian and Levantine colloquials. Most of my working life, I was a journalist, mostly in the Arabic speaking world, from Morocco to Iraq and Sudan and Oman in the South. Journalists like me translate every day in a rough and ready way. And I was always an, an enthusiastic reader of literature of every kind, but mostly either English or in English translation. I was exposed to Arabic in all its variety and I never privileged one kind over another. While learning Egyptian colloquial in Cairo in the 1970s, I remember transcribing with great dedication the lyrics of Abdul Halim Hafiz songs and the text of Kilmitain Rabes, the radio soliloquies by Fuad al Mohendis. I decided to learn Arabic at university on a whim, although I didn't articulate it at the age of 18. Later, I sometimes told people I made the decision because the Arabic speaking world looked like a different world, one that might be worth exploring. It was also diverse and readily accessible. One might say I othered it in a generally positive way. But with familiarity, much of that otherness faded away. I came to the conclusion that people are really are much the same everywhere. And that for most people, culture is a thin veneer, fragile, malleable, and susceptible to rapid change. Although speakers of Arabic are clearly not much different from anyone else, the culture of Arabic literature is very different from that of any other major language that I know of. That's really what I want to talk about today, how attitudes towards language and literature vary from place to place and over time, and how easy it is to be lulled into a complacent sense that it's always been the way it is here and now. Obviously, I'm especially interested in how these questions relate to translation. I turned to literary translation only a dozen years ago. And since then I've translated about 15 novels, several collections of short stories, several large non-fiction works and extracts from works by many dozens of writers from almost every Arab country. Translators spend most of their working lives poring over a single text for months at a time. So I haven't been able to catch up on all the great Arabic writers of even the past century and a half. Though I studied some pre-modern literature at university, my exposure to it in recent times has been sporadic and haphazard. Working translators have to read at least as much in their own language, the target language, as they do in their source language. For me, translation is 20% about understanding the text, 80% about writing something in English that reflects the original as closely as possible. I was recently reminded of the importance of wide reading after I couldn't think of an easy way to convey the idea in this little sentence. Kenneth Surit Abi Kadil Tasakat Bijafnaya Minidahil. About a week after I submitted my inadequate attempt in the middle of a larger text, I came across the perfect solution in the Guardian newspaper. Marina Hyde, writing about David Cameron's testimony in a parliamentary committee, wrote, quote, every time they close their eyes, the words lining their eyelids are going to be giant fraud. What I should have written was, when I closed my eyes, an image of my father lined my eyelids. Translators have to keep their eyes open to the wealth and versatility of their own language. 
Apart from my own relative ignorance, I was also a little wary of speaking in public about my work and Arabic fiction in general, because the subject is so fraught with sensitivities. I'm an outsider, and it's not my place to challenge the way writers write novels in Arabic. The most I can do is make some observations based on my own experience as a translator and admirer of many of the authors I have dealt with. As many of you know, Arabness is primarily, maybe even solely, a linguistic category. Arabs are people who speak Arabic, regardless of where they live, the color of their skin, their religion, or their way of life. Bound together by language, they value their language and have strong views about it. Many of them are committed to or conditioned to accept prescriptivist views of language, the belief that one form in this case, the form known as Fusha, or MSA as linguists call it, is more correct than others, more worthy, more expressive, and more aesthetically pleasing. Some of them even fetishize their ideal version of this language in a way that few other modern language communities even approach, outdoing the French several times over. It's an attitude that attaches high value to form, sometimes, I believe, at the expense of substance. Prescriptivism goes hand in hand with a belief in the immutability of language, the belief that the rules are set in stone for eternity, almost like the rules enshrined in scripture. Not surprisingly, the Islamists in general take this approach, even if they never write novels. In the 20th century, the Arab nationalists shared this position in the belief that any recognition of language diversity would undermine the unity of the Arab nation. Of course, in practice, few people can meet the high standard required by the prescriptivists, creating a divide between a hieratic caste of scribes and the rest of the population who muddle along with their underappreciated and sometimes even despised colloquial ways of speaking. Fusa is in effect a lingua franca, a language systematically used to make communication possible between groups of people who do not share a vernacular. Let's not deceive ourselves here. Listen to, listening to Tamim Barruti recite poems successfully in Fusa, Palestinian colloquial and Egyptian colloquial, it's quite obvious that these are three different languages, especially in rhythm and syllable structure. Unless the audience had frequent exposure to the other varieties, as is always the case, of course, in these interconnected times, these ways of speaking would not be mutually intelligible. Most of the books I translate are written in this lingua franca, a language that has not been anyone's mother tongue for at least a thousand years a language that no family speaks around the dinner table and that no lovers speak to each other in bed. This poses a massive problem for us translators and we must be honest about it. By all the, best, by all the principles of best practice, our versions of Arabic novels should reflect this gap between the everyday world and the way it's expressed in novels. In fact, I sometimes have the feeling that for this very reason, native speakers of Arabic find our translations into English disappointing in some way, as if what aspires to be sublime ends up being just too mundane. I suspect this is partly what Egyptian novelist Ibrahim Ferrali meant when he said that the works so far translated from Arabic to English, quote, have failed to give expression to the true nature of the Arab world's literary output, and they have proven unable to bring about any sort of audience for this literature. That's quite damning. But we translators don't have much choice in the matter. If we try to reflect the strange nature of a Fusha text, how far back should we go? English didn't exist as a language when the Arab grammarians set the rules for Fusha in the first centuries of the Arab Islamic empire. 
even if we compromise on an Augustan style, for example, pastiching Pope, Swift, and Defoe, it would be a monumental task and few of any publishers would want to publish the results of our labor. Of course, folk de mieux, we settle for the kind of English used by contemporary English novelists. And in most cases, there isn't any alternative. But the use of Futsari literature complicates the task for writers in Arabic too. Let's take a simple example. Our languages have many words for the way people laugh. In English, for example, we can chortle, chuckle, cackle, snicker, snigger, giggle, titter, and even guffaw. Some of these distinctions are very subtle. How do we learn those distinctions? Only by hearing how other people use these words in real life situations. For example, when someone laughs and someone else asks, what are you chuckling about? Fusha no doubt has many words for laughing too, but how would a writer make the same kind of fine distinction when the, those words are rarely or never used in the writer's lived experience when they don't correlate with a particular rhythm or tone of laughing that they have actually heard. Take the words we use to describe the states of mind of the people around us. This is a matter of prime importance for us as social beings. We have a vast nuanced range of words for moods, all of them finely tuned through day-to-day -day interactions. When we're confined to bookish words that no one ever utters at home, we lose the richness and the subtlety that these words offer. A lingua franca runs the risk of taking us to a cold, sanitized, homogenized world. When writers in ordinary spoken languages are wondering how to put an idea into words, they wonder how they would explain it to someone around them. But if you're writing in a lingua franca, the only valid test is how other writers have already expressed it. Since Fussar operates on a plane separate from real life, the usual reality check functions, the, the usual reality check mechanisms don't function well. The best writers have risen to the challenge, but the odds are stacked against them. Even with the best, I sometimes find myself translating their words back into ordinary language, I have this weird sensation that I'm having to read the author's mind when they first converted their thoughts into Pusha and then undo the conversion. I remember when the English translation of Ahmad Saadawi's Frankenstein in Baghdad was shortlisted for the Man Booker International Prize a few years ago. A newspaper contacted me to contribute to a pop quiz about amusing or quaint idioms in the various languages of the shortlisted books. It soon struck me that compared with living languages, Fusar has very few idioms in the sense of expressions not readily comprehensible from the component words. In fact, the concept of idiom runs counter to the ideology of a, a lingua franca, like the French of Descartes or Esperanto as envisaged by its creator, such a language should be crystal clear, almost mathematical. Yet the various colloquials of Arabic are of course as rich in idioms as any other language. Frankly, I'm amazed that anyone ever manages to write a novel in any language. The stamina, the commitment, the inspiration make it seem almost miraculous. For a novelist in Arabic, the obstacles are even greater. Because of the constraints imposed by the literary establishment, I sometimes feel that writers in Arabic are voluntarily working with one hand, one hand tied behind their backs. With or without their consent, they are like composers who write music on the basis that there are only 12 possible notes in an octave, or that the piano is the only instrument worth playing. Of course, in a way, that was the purpose of Fusai. It made sense in the days before radio, television, film, and large-scale movement from country to country. But the barriers have been breaking down for a while. Arabs are constantly exposed to other ways of speaking and even writing through video clips and social media comments in their various colloquials.
But in the world of literature, the conservatives still hold sway. They dominate the establishment, the media, the academic and political worlds, casting a pall of conformity and a heavy dose of antiquarianism over public discourse. I came across this very early in my translating experience. The first full-length book I translated was Taxi by the Egyptian writer Khalid al-Khamisi. Unusually for Arabic fiction, fiction, this book is written almost entirely in Egyptian colloquial. It's a rich text, a, a series of vignettes into Cairo life in all its diversity, full of vitality, pathos, and humor. I loved working on it, and I was excited when it was well received. I should point out here that when I mention the text, I'm not saying it's a work of genius and superior to every other possible text I might have mentioned. In the end, we translators are not critics. We translate things that take our fancy, things English language readers might find interesting, things publishers ask us to translate. And in the case of many translators, I'm sorry to say, horrible things that help them pay the rent. But after Taxi came out, I noticed subtle jibes by the guardians of language. Although the Arabic text sold very well, and perhaps because of that, many critics couldn't conceive of the possibility that Arabic li literature could exist outside the very narrow parameters set by the ancient grammarians. A book like Taxi just could not count, they said. It wasn't worthy of consideration simply because of the language in which it was written, and it certainly didn't deserve to be translated. In recent years, the English literary trans establishment has thankfully taken a more generous attitude towards works in non-standard English. Irving Welsh of Trainspotting, who writes in Scots dialect that is daunting to outsiders at first sight, is seen as a serious writer. He writes with style, imagination, wit and force in a voice that which those alienated by much current fiction clearly want to hear, says the Times Literary Supplement. One of the many books I read under lockdown, Marlon James's A Brief History of Seven Killings, many chapters of which are, are written in Jamaican Patois, won the Man Booker Prize and two other literary prizes. The Wall Street Journal said of it, a tour de force, an audacious, demanding, inventive literary work. These scenarios are hard to imagine in the Arabic context. It goes beyond literature too. Although most Arabic speakers can understand the language of the media through expensive expo extensive exposure, only a small minority can speak it competently. In effect, hundreds of millions of people are pushed to the sidelines of public discourse or excluded entirely. The effect is especially pernicious on children in their formative years. Surveys show that the practice of parents reading to children is much less common in Arabic speaking countries than elsewhere. Though things are gradually changing, most of the books for children are written in a language that children hardly understand and that some parents struggle with themselves. One of my next major translation ventures was Yomidin, Judgment Day, by the Lebanese writer Rasha Lamir, a work of a completely different kind from Hamisi's. The novel, a love story between an educated urban woman and a repressed Muslim cleric from the countryside, is written in an almost pre-modern style, meaning the style that prevailed before the changes in Arabic that came about in the mid-19th century. The couple fall in love while parsing and unraveling the poems of the Mutanabbi, the brash 10th century poet, who may have wanted to, to declare himself a prophet, but decided to settle for fame as a poet. In the introduction that I wrote at the time, I celebrated the classicism of her style. I noted that although Fusha was no one's mother tongue, it was, quote, the common heritage of all those diligent and studious enough to adopt it as a vehicle for their thoughts. On reflection a decade later, my views have changed somewhat. I can now see that the strength of Russia's work 
lies in her ability to dissect human motivation in detail, like Proust or Jane Austen. In other words, in the content and not in the form. I believe it's possible to do that effectively in any language spoken by any community. Reading Sally Rooney's massively popular Normal People in preparation for this talk, strangely, you might think, I realized that this was Rooney's strength too, noting the subtle signals people sent each other in words and gestures and how these relate to their inner lives. Rooney does this in simple spoken English of the kind you and I use daily. Another early venture of mine was a collection of short stories by the Iraqi writer Hassan Blasim, The Madman of Freedom Square. Hassan is an interesting case, a filmmaker by training. He left Baghdad when Saddam Hussein was in power and took several years working his way across Eurasia, crossing borders by clandestine means if necessary, until he finally settled in Finland where he lives today. Hassan's stories read rather like the shot list for a film interspersed with dialogue, sometimes with elements of Iraqi colloquial, not a language I knew well at the time. And Hassan doesn't hold Fusha sacred. He might write, he began as Be'er Del Alif without a Hamza, as in Iraqi colloquial Bidah. Readers expecting a Fusha text would read the word as Bada, it seemed, Looking back on this now, I remember it was a little irritating, mainly because it made my task more difficult. At first, I had to check with him each time, just in case. When you wrote Bada, did you mean Bada, uh, he began, for example? When he replied, yes, of course, I thought to myself, well, why did you write it that way? I've gone past that now. I'm better attuned to his style. But the guardians of language jump on things like that. In fact, one of the first questions a reviewer asks of a new literary work in Arabic is, is it properly written? In other words, does the writer observe all the complicated rules of grammar and orthography? When Hassan Blessin recently announced on Facebook that he was writing a novella wholly in Iraqi colloquial, possibly the first such work in history, he recorded a wide range of responses from his audience. Colloquial Iraqi wouldn't be able to reflect the real world, one reader said. This was Hassan's reply, and, and I broadly endorse it. So it's Fusha that can reflect the real world? A sentence in Fusha sounds like one of those histrionic actors in those TV serials. When you read a sentence in Fusha, you can, read, you can feel a certain voice and tone. Imagine someone opening a story in Fusha like this, the vehicular explosive contraption fulminated while I was partaking of my matitudinal repast. So does this sentence reflect the real world better and more truthfully than if I were to say, as I was having breakfast, the car bomb blew up? Colloquial language is sensual, warm and honest. You feel it from your heart and it is remarkably extinct, end of quote. Elitism over the correct register for Arabic literature goes hand in hand with elitism over the choice of words for translation, works for translation into English, which is a highly contested domain. Partly because so few English language publishers read Arabic and because the public and critical reception of books in Arabic is difficult to gauge from outside, we translators often end up as gatekeepers between authors and publishers, a reluctant one in my case. Naturally enough, it's impossible to please everyone. There's a widespread belief that some mysterious force chooses the books to be translated. Listen to critic Gebir Asfor, briefly Egyptian minister of culture, for example, quote, a globally prevalent neo-Orientalist tendencies adopts a set of literary and artistic works from the third world in general and the Middle East in particular, abounding with exposés of a ubiquitous, bavile backwardness and rampant corruption at every level. 
This has given rise to the phenomenon of the modish, scandalizing novel of limited creative value that lets no corruption, oppression, perversion, or deviance pass unmentioned. One of the aims is to perpetuate in the minds of Westerners an image of an East in decline, alien, fantastical, backward, and oppressed to justify the need for colonialist domination of the region, end quote. No one denies that there was a spurt of interest in Arabic literature in Euro-American circles after the attacks of September 2001 and the political arrest that started in 2011. Some of this interest was indeed ethnographic or even prurient rather than purely literary, but I find it hard to see any correlation between Asfor's conspiracy theory and the books I have worked on over the years. Besides, some of the works favored by the traditionalists exhibit many of the features that Asfor condemns with such venom. Take The Sleepwalkers, Isse Irun Niema by Saad Makeri, for example, which I often see cited as one of the great Arabic novels that has never been translated into English. I know the book well because I have in fact translated it, though the publisher has been sitting on my translation for some years. It's an interesting work written in the 1960s, a panoramic historical novel set in Egypt in the last 50 years of the Mamluk state, that is in the late 15th and early 16th centuries. It took me a while to warm to the book, but in the end I found many virtues in it. But the book does contain barbaric cruelty of all kinds, decadent indulgence in drugs, sexual predation, a dysfunctional family dispute that ends in brutal murder, religious superstition in the form of Sufi holy men, and a stereotypical Jewish apothecary who sells poisons to the aristocracy. I wrote a long introduction to the book in 2010, and I quote my own comments on my impressions at the time. Makeri wrote The Sleepwalkers in highly stylized, sometimes artificial, literary Arabic, which is increasingly out of favor. An unusual feature of his writing if his, is his anthropom anthropomorphization of inanimate objects or natural phenomena. In a similar vein, he often identifies people by one of their accessories or physical features. He writes that the red turban sat down, or the bushy moustache lost its temper, for example. Makeri also delights in displaying his knowledge of exotic Arabic vocabulary, sometimes overloading sentences with quasi-synonyms in a way that might appear contrived to a modern reader in English. Browsing through the recently translated essays of the Egyptian writer El Mawailehe, who wrote about 1900, I came across synonym chains of this kind on almost every page, exalted and revered, rob and despoil, collecting and amassing, squander and waste. It continues into recent times. The works I'm asked to translate are peppered with locutions such as fear, dread and terror, or worry, anguish and concern. Yet when I come to think about McCary's book now with the benefits of hindsight, Maybe these were the elements that Arabic readers valued. Maybe they would want to see them retained in an English translation. Would English, reader, English language readers go along with that? How many of them would say, well, oh, that's an original, interesting way to write a novel? Who do we translators serve anyway? The culture of the source text or the readers who buy the books we translate? That's a question that keeps coming up and I shall return to it later. As far as accusation of neo-Orientalism always lurks around the corner, whatever we translators do, especially those of us who are white men. Do we dare adjust the text to make it more accessible? Should we assume that the probable readers already have advanced degrees in area studies? Oddly, the accusation of neo-Orientalism can be directed at unexpected targets. We outsiders with an interest in Arabic have to steer a narrow course across rocky shoals. Take, for example, this case of a well-known American professor of Islamic studies, a convert to Islam. 
And Hossein Abu Zahr, one of the founders of the Living Arabic Project, recently argued in favor of using colloquial Arabic more widely. The professor replied, the world is full of people who actually care about speaking higher register Arabic so that they can have serious conversations about higher registered topics. People who complain about this don't care about speaking Arabic like an educated adult. Some years, some hours later, after complaints from social media participants, including many people with Arabic names, he retreated. After, reflect, after reflecting on how my words have embodied or advanced colonialism and white saviorism, I've decided to retract my statement that recourse to Fusha is required for discussing high register topics. I somehow doubt that Fusha needs white saviorism to survive. But the idea that ordinary people can't discuss higher register topics because they don't speak the right language is both insulting and preposterous. Of course, the usual explanation for the survival and prevalence of Fusha in literature is culture and tradition. But this, this raises some interesting questions about community continuity and change in culture not just in literature, but in wider society. People commonly assume that communities retain their culture by default. They think it takes convulsive events to divert culture from its natural trajectory. Cultural continuity and change are rather like continuity and change in foodstuffs. People assume medieval Italians ate pizzas with tomato paste and Shakespeare dined on Turkey for Christmas. The Egyptians in Makeri's novels are portrayed as drinking coffee more than a century before coffee arrived in Egypt. Similarly, conservatives can talk confidently about the Arab literary tradition as something ancient and permanent, and people take them seriously. But the world is not like that. Children are born free of culture. There are no markers of culture in DNA. Sociologist Barrington Moore says as well, quote, Culture is not something that exists outside of or independently of individual human beings living together in society. Cultural, cultural values do not descend from heaven to influence the course of history. They are abstractions by an observer based on the observation of certain similarities in the way groups of people behave. To explain behavior in terms of cultural values is to engage in circular reasoning. The assumption, of in, the assumption of inertia that cultural and social continuity do not require explanation obliterates the fact that both have to be created anew in each generation, <coughs> often with great pain and suffering. To maintain and transmit a value system Human beings are punched, bullied, sent to jail, thrown into concentration camps, cajoled, bribed, made into heroes, encouraged to read newspapers, stood up against a wall and shot, and sometimes even taught sociology. Not only that, even with a, within a single generation, cultural change can be dramatic. When I grew up, Homosexual acts were illegal in this country, and many schools taught large doses of Latin and Greek to their pupils. At one school I personally attended at the age of 12, Latin and Greek took up 40% of our class time. Same-sex marriages are now routine, and Latin has no part in mainstream education. When I was born, the minority ethnic community in this country amounted to about 100,000 people. It's now about 8 million, 80 times as many in their presence has transformed the cultural landscape, largely for the better. So when politicians speak of British values or critics speak of the Arab literary tradition, we should immediately be on our guard. Probably what they want to define those values or that tradition in a tendentious way that suits their various interests. In the case of Arabic literature, Change has been dramatic anyway. Novels in their present form are largely an innovation of the early 20th century. In its early stages, the genre was heavily influenced by translations 
from the widely read European novelists of the 19th century. Ask Arab novelists who has influenced their work. They are more likely to say Kafka or Marquez than they are to say Jahu or Ferris Shidiak. Off the top of my head, I would estimate that the volume of narrative fiction written in Arabic in the last 40 or 50 years greatly exceeds the amount written in the previous 1400 years. Writers of Arabic fiction are breaking new ground every year. I would go even further. Some of the best literature ever written in Arabic is being written today. Some of this new literature is taking Arabic into areas of human life and aspects of the human mind that it's never explored before. Writers today are inventing the tradition of the future, but when it comes to language, they are putting new wine in old skins. New wine in new skins might taste even better. For centuries, poetry dominated the Arab literary landscape. Poetry is the Arab archive and the epitome of literature, as Abu Faris and Hamdani said in the 10th century. But Arabic literature underwent a total transformation in the mid 20th century. The old poetry, which followed rigid pre-Islamic patterns of rhyme and meter, was suddenly replaced by free verse or prose verse with few rhymes, loose meter, sometimes no obvious meter at all. Changes in the texture of written fossa predate those changes in poetry by about 100 years. These earlier changes are overlooked by those who prefer to emphasize continuity for reasons of supposed cultural authenticity. European domination in the 19th century, a byproduct of the Industrial Revolution, led to a massive translation process, which inevitably brought calques and European modes of expression into Arabic. Expressions such as yuja, there is, lem yaud, no longer, and the use of ither to introduce indirect questions, imitating the English if or the French si. Innovations from the Nafta period, Yaroslav Stekovic lists dozens of examples of stylistic borrowings that are now fully incorporated into written Arabic. But while Fusa Arabic has adapted to new circumstances, the conservatives cling to the myth that the language cannot change. Until recently, most of the dictionaries were hopelessly out of date, filled with recycled 19th century definitions and heedless of the subtle changes that old core words have undergone in the meantime. Lexicography is improving, but it's not the conservatives who are leading the way because they don't want to recognize change. Others have taken over, people like Hossam Abu Zahr, whom I mentioned earlier, whose website now contains masses of material on spoken language from Egypt, the Levant, and North Africa. There are sites that specialize in Gulf Arabic and Iraqi Arabic too. My Twitter feed is full of professional and amateur linguists announcing their latest discoveries. The strange thing is that in the real world, there doesn't need to be a dichotomy between Fossa and colloquial. There's a spectrum of registers that spans the gap between the two. And Fusar expressions are deeply embodied in daily speech. They can coexist and interact. On the quiet, many writers in Arabic are slowly bypassing the conservatives, some deliberately and some unwittingly. Reading Hosanna Habayev's novel, Kabla Antanem and Malika, Before the Queen Falls Asleep last year, I found plenty of Levantine colloquial words I wasn't familiar with. And I don't mean words for objects specific to a Palestinian context. I mean colorful expressions that con for concepts common to us all, such as sayer, nayer, wandering around freely. In an Algerian book I've been working on, the author writes, kharaja fiha tai tai, a partially Berber expression for telling it straight. In a text just the other day, I came across the colloquial expression natarajismahu, for something like he jerked his or recoil. One day someone will write an Arabic novel that breaks all the conventions, mixing language from every possible register, and yet a book so brilliant and original and so indisputably a work of genius that the guardians of language will find it hard to dismiss it. Then writers in Arabic can break their chains and give free rein to their linguistic inventiveness. Although I seem to have a reputation in some circles as a populist, 
I don't really have a stake in how Arab writers write their novels. That's a choice they'll make for themselves in their particular social and professional context. I'll take them as they come and judge them on their content rather than their form. But whatever form they come in, I will continue to make them sound like English. My approach has always been to imagine how the writer might have written their book if by chance they suddenly woke up bilingual in English. Isn't that the obvious approach? The translation theorists call it domestication. I was especially pleased to find myself recently in agreement on this with Michael Cooperson, one of the finest and most ingenious Arabic English translators around. Asked in a recent interview what makes a good translation, he said, I'm going to be blunt and say domestication. I don't deny that aggressive exotification of the Nabokovian kind has its place for certain purposes, but once it makes its point, which it does pretty quickly, the charm wears off. Cooperson's latest translation, his acclaimed version of Hariri's Makamat, pushes domestication to the limits, translating each of the 50 Makamas into a different version of English, including Cockney rhyming slang, Chaucerian English, Nigerian English, and Gilbert and Sullivan operetta style. The irony, of course, is that Hariri's original wasn't written in 50 different versions of Arabic, but almost entirely in a single stylized form of rhyming prose. I can't say where literature in forms of Arabic is heading. There's a chance that Fusha, or a mod or modified version of it, will become a true mother tongue spoken by millions of educated Arabs at home from childhood. The evidence from history suggests that this is unlikely. The more likely outcome is that over centuries, dialect clusters will gradually coalesce into relatively stable standard languages in much the same way as Latin evolved into Italian, French, Spanish, and so on. That would open up new possibilities for diverse literatures grounded in the daily lives of the people who spoke those languages. One way or another, change is inevitable. Language conservatives, like political conservatives, pretend that change can be postponed, even stopped in its tracks. They imagine a golden age and they see decline all around them. I prefer to see change as an opportunity for improvement and, en and enrichment. Writers in Arabic, as in all languages, do their best work when they feel free to innovate and explore, when they embrace change. Judging by the signs I see around me, many of them are doing so already, and I hope they will continue. And I thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Jonathan. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, we're now going to the question and answer section of this event. Um, we have um, around 20 minutes or a little over. Uh, and um, uh, I'm going to go to the first question that we have from Becky Maddock. And she says, do you think that by writing in modern standard Arabic, authors are making their books available to a wider audience across the Arab world? If authors wrote in dialect, would they find it more difficult to market their work outside their home country? Yes, of course they would. Uh, I, and I think that that is actually probably the major motive, one of the major motivations, motivations for, for, for our writers in Arab. But uh, I have an interesting uh, insight into that. I, back in the summer in July, I think it was, I, I did a translation um, workshop with um, at Bristol University. And um, I, uh, we, we, we did a variety of texts and one of them was an Iraqi colloquial text. And uh, none of the participants were Iraqis and they managed to, to, to work to understand it with great ease, I, I was I was over, I was really surprised at how 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 receptive they were to our, to it and how easily they found they found it to 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 to, to negotiate their way through it. And and as I as as I mentioned in in my 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 my, my lecture, 
when I, when I, I I'm not familiar with Jamaican Patwa. Uh, when I read uh, Marlon James's book, I, I learned it as I went, but I, I mean, I, I actually found it a, a kind of really interesting voyage to, to go on. And, and, I, I, and I think actually people are exposed to other ways of speaking. I don't think it's a massive obstacle. I think they, I think they would very soon learn. Okay, um, my next question uh, is from May Zaki. And she says, you talked about the differences between Fusha and the dialects. How do you reflect that in your translations, especially in a novel that mixes the two, narration well, I, versus I don't dialogue? At all. I mean, there's no way we can do it. I mean, what it, it the, the we, we we don't have as I as I mentioned we we don't we don't have a realistic alternative. We, we there's no way we can reflect that that split that 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 gap between the two in English. Why? I mean, I mean, I think the novelist actually, I, I, I think I, I actually, it, it raises another question, which I, I would like to ask the other way around. When, when, when Arab readers read a book translated from a European language, do they kind of assume that this is some kind of literary, that the original is some kind of literary language, or do they understand it that it's just the way ordinary people speak every day? I don't know, uh, uh, you know. The, it, it's a it's a it's a problem, but there's no obvious solution. Uh, we we just do what we can. Uh, we we just we just translate it in a, in a way that that our readers are going to understand readily. We we have no choice. Right. So the next question is from Mirva Haloum, and she says, "How do the novels that you select for translation come to your attention in the first?" Place. Do you select them based on their popularity and significance in the Arab world? Well, uh, it, you know, it's 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 a kind of complicated process, but I can assure you, it's it's very ad hoc and very random, and there's no kind of there's no kind of system involved in this at all. It's many people acting in a marketplace in in in, in many. With many different uh, factors weighing in, um, sometimes people come to me with a book, and I look at it and say, "Well, I like it," but then we have to find a publisher who's willing to pay for it. Or sometimes publishers come to me and they uh, and they they offer a book to me, and 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 I get many offers. I get several at least. I get many offers, and some, some I turn down, some I accept. But it's a very random process, and it's not a and I don't think I, I, I don't pretend I, I'm not you know I don't see it as my mission to you know choose the very best and then present it to the world. I choose things that I like. Uh, then they may not be maybe they're good, maybe they're bad, but you know who knows. I I, I do it on a personal uh, matter of personal choice. Right. So um, I have a related question here. Um, which is, who is it that decides which Arabic novels get translated into English? How do the books get chosen? Is it you or the translator thinking, oh, I like this book, or I, I think this would really add to the body of translated literature that's out there? Is it publishers who think, oh, this book would sell very well, um, or an agent who sends it to them? Let uh, let's contact the translator and get it translated. It's it's a bit it's a bit of everything. It's a very haphazard, random process. There are a few agents now, which is fairly new, who 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 uh, do samples and they promote samples around publishers. Um, but it's often actually uh, translators going to publishers and saying, um, "I have a sample of this book, and here's this is what the book's about. Would you like to pay me to translate it?" And that is probably the the thing. And then a book. Books that win prizes, of course, have a big advantage because, you know, they you can that that gives them a certain credibility to the publisher because the publishers they don't they, they have no idea what these books are about they can't read them and they 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 have a very limited access to to material about them uh, so it's a bit of everything but it it's often translators going to publishers and saying we like this book right um, so. The next question is, who are the most innovative writers writing in Arabic today? Obviously, in your view. 
Well, that's a difficult one because I, I don't read enough. I don't I don't have time to 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 read as widely as I would like. Uh, you, there are other people you might ask about that. I mean, I, I hesitate to, to to name names because I, I just you know there may be people out there that are really innovative and I should know about them. Maybe I don't. I I, I don't know. And um, perhaps you should ask Marcia. She's um, she's good on that kind. Of, she she's has a much wider vision of what's going on or the people at Banipal too, they have a much wider picture of, of, of the whole scene. Um, so I, I, I'm, hesit I'm hesitant to, to, to answer that question in that way. Okay. Um, I've got a question here from Fabio Chayani, and I hope I'm not mispronouncing the name. And he says, for a monumental novel in which different Baghdadi dialects and Fusha adventurously exist, we could turn to the late Jewish Iraqi writer Samir Naqash's Nuzala al Khat Khat al Shaitan. Um, and on Blasim, he says, isn't it correct that the great majority of his works are actually in Fusha? Can you comment on this? Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, Hassan writes in Fusha, yeah, yeah, but pretty much, yeah. Uh, though he, he has written, a, he wrote, recently wrote a, a, a novella in a Colloquial, which I have translated and it might come out soon. And um, I, was, I very much enjoyed doing it because it, I didn't actually, I had to do quite a lot of research and uh, ask lots of questions. Uh, but you also write about Samir Nakash. Samir Nakash, if I remember rightly, and I have seen some of his work, he, he used a lot of Iraqi Colloquial. Um, and that was a, uh, and, and that's a, a very precious um, resource for, 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 for our knowledge of Iraqi colloquial in the 1940s or whatever. Um, and it's a very special, uh, in fact, all those Iraqi Jew, Jewish writers are, are, are very unusual and, um, and wrote in, in very innovative ways for their time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think the, um, the, the latest issue of Banipal is, is um, uh, doing something on Iraqi Jewish writers. Um, next question is from Jam Jamal or Jamil Talib. Uh, and he thinks, he says, do you think that some translations into English make some novels poorly written in Arabic look good? Um, mm. That's a difficult one there. Um, I think it's possible that sometimes it, it, there's, there's a problem in, in the Arab literary world with editing. There aren't many professional, well-paid, dedicated editors who are willing to sit down with a book and work really hard on it, it, it deeply in, in, you know, so say, Let's remove this chapter, rewrite this, put this first, change the structure here, and do that. That that, that just doesn't doesn't happen very much. And it's mainly a matter of money. It's not because they're the, the unwilling to do it. It's just that the the the, the financial asset, the financial environment doesn't allow for that kind of expense. So yes, it's possible that uh, a book that uh, should have been edited. Uh, substantially in Arabic might turn up in English translation and be edited and actually turn out to be superior. That might happen. Yes, I, I, I would accept that. But mainly because the it hasn't been properly edited in the original Arabic version. Right. And there's a question here from Kristina Osipova. And she says, how do you evaluate the literary qualities of a new novel in Arabic? What is crucial for you, the plot or the language? Well, um, obviously plot, yes. Plot matters, the characters matter, the, the, the delineation of character, the development of character through the through through the the novel as a whole, uh, language, yes, but uh, but I mean not in the sense of whether it's properly written or not, but whether whether the description resonates with me, whether I can whether it 
it it creates a, 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 a an image in my mind that um, that that makes sense. Uh, yeah, so it's so it's a it's a whole it's a mixture of all kinds of things. It's um, yeah. Right. There's a question here from Saib Eigner. I hope I haven't mispronounced the surname. And uh, he says, why aren't there translated volumes of the early known and great Arab poets of the 9th, 9th to 12th century available for public retail and consumption? Right. Um, that's a good question, yeah. Well, the Library of Arabic Literature is actually doing a lot of good work on this. This is a, I think it's a New York University venture. Um, they, they, and they are, they, they are working on, on quite a few uh, early poets. It, translating those poets, uh, you'd be surprised how much there is around, but the Mutanabi, for example, has not been much translated because it is extremely difficult. It's really, really hard to translate this literature effectively. I mean, you can either, well, you have, you have to make some really uh, important choices at an early stage, whether you're going to do a kind of academic, uh, you know, study course type translation, which basically explains to the reader what it means, or whether you do a kind of loose, imaginative, um, you know, uh, a translation uh, 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 that um, conveys the, the the general impression without sticking too closely, and 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 neither and and, and and either way, it's it's very difficult to make it really very readable to English language readers. So that's why. But uh, people are working on it. I, I know that there's a, somebody's doing the complete works of Mutanabi, I believe, which has uh, never been done before. And people have done uh, Abu Ala Ma'ari, for example. He's, 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 I think there's hasn't, hasn't the Library of Arab Literature done quite a lot of his poetry? I think so. So it's coming along. And, and you will find some Victorian translations of, of these poets, uh, all the, the Malakata all being done again. They've all been done many times, but they are being done again. And uh, I think the new versions are even better than the old. They're getting better and better all the time. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it takes time, but it's coming along. Right. I have a, an interesting question here from Sophia Vasalou. Uh, and she says, returning to the laughter example, I wonder whether the contrast with English is perfectly fair. Don't we learn the distinctions between some of the words for laughter, guffo, guffo, torto, titter, etc., through written texts? How often do we use them or hear them used in ordinary conversation? Everyday conversation has an impoverished vocabulary compared with written texts. The limited range of vocabulary is what strikes one about the dialect which there is a result of their having been sealed off from written expression. Both Fosha and Amiya are defective in this sense, but it seems that Amiya would have to go through a process of enrichment and growth to be usable for literary composition. Actually, I, I think I disagree quite uh, strongly on this, Sophia. Um, I very much think that the distinction between chortling and chuckling is something one learns from lived experience and not from books. I don't see how one could learn it from a book because the di distinction depends very much on, 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 on the, the sound of, of the laughter. And um, when you, uh, and I, I, I don't, I'm not sure I accept that uh, Amir's uh, uh, need enrichment um, because they can, where necessary, they can tap into the Fusha resources at any time that's all available to them. Just like, just like English can tap into Latin and Greek at will. I mean, you can make up a new Latin, a new word in English based on some Latin or Greek uh, word at, at, at any moment and get away with it. Um, similarly, uh, any Amir used in literature could tap into Fusha at will and borrow it uh, if necessary. So I, but I, I, I suspect you'll find that in fact, uh, colloquial forms of Arabic have quite a few words for forms of laughter, which probably don't appear in, in Fusha at all. Right. 
And this question is from Yassin Hayat Selfe. Uh, and he says, I wondered if you could talk about domestication. Doesn't an approach which seeks to entirely domesticate a text presume that the target language is completely stable and free from foreignness? Translating into English makes Arabic literature potentially accessible to people all over the world. Isn't it okay if a reader finds something exotic, quote unquote? Why should art make you feel completely at home? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I um, uh, perhaps I should uh, elaborate slightly on that particular point. Um, when I say domestication, I, I certainly don't mean complete domestication. For example, if, if, if I come across a simile in, in, in an Arabic text that may be um, a cliche in Arabic, but uh, and it may it may be may make sense to uh, translate it by an, uh, the equivalent cliche in English. I think it's per I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy sometimes if, if the simile makes sense in English, just to, to borrow it as it is and not to domesticate it. So there is a certain exoticization. I mean, if you say, for example, he's as thin as a palm tree or something, instead of saying thin as a rake, then fine, no problem. Um, you know, so, but um, I, I'm really talking about the kind of, you know, the nuts and bolts of the language, you know, the, the so, so you can, so they can be read and, 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 and read smoothly. Uh, that's what I, that's, that's the domestication I'm talking about. I mean, there are extreme forms of domestication where you kind of change the names and you move the, you move the action to, you know, a London suburb rather than Cairo. I'm not talking about that kind of domestication. No, not at all. Um, a question from Ibrahim Badshah. Uh, he said, I read your statement on a website saying you changed something in Saud al sanusis text because the editor suggested it. Does that take away the agency of the author entirely from the translation? And indeed, there is a big gap between the source and target texts in terms of the form and stylistics. Do you think the editing culture in English is affecting the translation practice? Yeah, well, I, I, I know about this case because I've discussed it with Saud uh, in detail uh, on uh, a number of occasions. And I, I, I kind of apologized to him. It, it wasn't something I thought very deeply about at the time. And it, it was very minor, I had to, to be honest. I mean, it didn't affect the substance of the book at all. It's, it's, it was a tiny fr fraction. Um, and maybe I regret it, actually. I mean, I, I could have, uh, well, there, 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 well there, was, there were two separate issues here. But one of them was in the original book, Saud needed a, an explanation, a kind of cover story to explain how this book appeared in Arabic when it was written, it was narrated by a young Filipino boy or young man who, who didn't write Arabic, right? So he needed to have a kind of cover, an explanation for this. So he invented a translator who translated it. Whereas in the English version, this didn't seem to matter very much because no English reader would be asking the same question about how this text had appeared in English because we were just we were just saying it was a translation. So they, they you know, it, it was. So the only issue really was the question about the football match at the end of the book, uh, and uh, and I, and I was I just got it in my head that um, publishers don't like footnotes, so the footnote didn't appear. That's all it was. It was a very minor thing, and I don't think anyone should make a big deal out of it. Okay, um, this question is from Nashwa Nasr al -Din. How closely do you work with the authors of the books you translate? I think I've heard you say in the past that you tend to ask a lot of questions. Is that still the case? I ask a lot of questions, yeah. yeah. I ask a lot of questions. I, um, I, I usually do it by email, but not always. Sometimes I do it in uh, voice um, conversation. Um, I do it by email because I think it's actually more, it's often better to give them time to think about the answer. You sometimes get a better uh, response than if you do it on the phone instantly. 
but yeah, I mean, I, I think I think my I don't know what my record is, but my record was about like three hundred questions or something on a book, something like that. I mean, a lot, a big, big document. I mean, possibly too many, but um, but uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm nervous. I mean, I, I, I don't like to make guesses. I, I check things, and sometimes I actually try to. Dr- draw out the author on what how they imagine the scene something a bit extra to because sometimes when you're translating you need to know a few extra things which aren't in the text but which are in the head of the author and sometimes I but that often authors are a bit reluctant to give a lot of time to that kind of question for obvious reasons I mean it's not um, Right, and um, Mark Allen has a very interesting question. What's your assessment of the effect of state censorship on literary production and, importantly, the market for books? Actually, um, surprisingly, it's very ineffective. I'm not sure it has a great deal of effect, really. Um, It's a hard one, that, because it's quite hard to quantify. But probably less than you imagine uh, from outside. Um, we often hear stories of books being banned here and banned there, but the truth is they all slip through uh, one way or another. Because a lot of a lot of literature in the Arab world is read by PDFs, which are downloaded from the internet, unfortunately, because it undermines the author's income. But it's very very common and. And all these books are available in that form if you look around for them. In fact, sometimes because in London it's quite hard to find Arabic books, sometimes I do it myself. Unfortunately, I, 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 I uh, apologize for, for doing it, but that's it's so much easier. Right. Could this, this is my question. Could the fact that um, some of the literature that gets translated is actually produced by Arab Arab writers in exile, could that be playing a role in circumventing censorship? Yes, certainly, yeah, yeah. I mean, with the case of the Iraqis, it's it's extraordinary. Uh, Very few of them are now, of the big Iraqi contemporary writers are living in Iraq today. Uh, there's Mohsen uh, Ramli in uh, Ali Badr in Brussels, Mohsen in Madrid, there's uh, Hassan in Finland, there's others, there's Asha Gjergis in Oslo, and I mean, there's a whole bunch of them all over the place. Uh, very few, only Ahmed Saad uh, and a few others are still in Baghdad, but yeah, and those people, of course, because they're in Europe, they, they, they don't feel censorship at all, they feel to, they're free to do what they want. Right. Well, thank you very, very much, Jonathan, for a very interesting lecture and for answering all those thought provoking questions. Um, We've come to the end of our event. Thanks very much for attending it. Thanks to the British Library for hosting it. And thanks to Omar Saif Robash and his family for sponsoring it. Please take a bit of time to fill out the survey that will appear once I finish talking. To find more events from the British Library, please visit the What's On pages on their website. You can keep in touch with Banipal by visiting the websites of both the Banipal Trust and Banipal Magazine. Good night. Good night. Thank you.